Eight months ago, you converted to Islam. Yes. You were from a Christian background, you said? Yeah, my mother was a Protestant of some kind. I think she was just kind of a loose Protestant. And then um, during my teenage years, I was on and off again, Christian, very loosely. Basically, I just believed in Jesus. That was basically it. And um, yeah, I was, as of recent, I've had some more questions about Islam and Christianity. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of, when I converted, I kind of assumed it was a lot simpler than I thought. I didn't really have any nuance to it. I was kind of like, oh, the Bible's wrong. Yeah. You know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I just want to clear up some questions. I want to apologize in advance to a lot of these are probably going to be layman questions. Yeah, speak a little louder on the mic, brother. Just a little louder. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Just keep make sure you're close to the mic. Uh, I want to apologize in advance because a lot of these are going to be layman questions. That I That's really right. Don't worry about it. You don't need to apologize. So, but okay. uh, you ended up becoming what was the reason why you became Muslim? Um, so. I got interested in it because of I was a big fan of Sneeko. I know you don't like Sneeko, but I was a fan of Sneeko. Mm. And so when he started question, when he started when he converted, I uh, looked more into Islam. And from there, I kind of just took a lot of um, I don't know word presuppositions and thought it was a lot simpler. So I kind of just went with it. But I've had some more questions as of late. So I know where you want to start. The Sneeko had somewhat of an influence, huh? Uh, yes, Nico and uh, Andrew Tate, I'd say. I know you guys say that's cringe or whatever, but yeah, those two kind of introduced it. And then through the research, I kind of came to it. All right. Okay, so now with that said, you were watching Sneeko, a couple of interviews, so Islam sounded interesting. But now you have questions not about only Christianity, but Islam. What what made you start having questions about uh, Islam? Not Christianity, I'm sorry, because you have now questions about both. Um, so with Islam, I was always watching the debates and stuff because I, I kind of like the type of content. So I'd, I'd subscribe to like Uthman <laughs> and, um, some others. Yeah. And, um, I also started watching your stuff. This is why I called you. I started watching your stuff and a lot of times they have a difficult time answering you yes. if at all. Yes. So like, yep. for example, like the, uh, the Isha, the Aisha thing. Yes. When I went to the mosque and I asked them about it. He gave like the um, the modern, whatever it's called, when it's like the modernist thing where it's like they used to do that in the past or whatever. I kind of just took that for granted and accepted it. Hmm. But I kind of like look back at it, it's like it's kind of weird. So, yeah. So, you ended up finding me on YouTube and then you saw that it, they're not able to answer because just to give you a little bit of my background, in the 90s, when I was coming back to religion, to belief in God, I got confronted by a member of the Nation of Islam, gave me a Quran, so I got baffled, confused about the Quran, but then I started reading the Bible, started reading the Gospels, fell in love with Jesus, but then a Muslim attacked me, I mean, not physically, attacked me uh, intellectually with objections from the Bible, I had no answers, but I started praying, asking God to give me the answers, and I told the Lord, if you give me answers, then I will devote myself by your grace to make sure no other Christian gets humiliated and that I will help Christians destroy the objections against the faith. And the Lord in his mercy answered me. And then I found the website Answering Islam and I started writing for it in 1999. So there isn't an objection that a Muslim can bring up that the Lord hasn't blessed us with providing answers to. <clears throat> so I glorify Jesus Christ, no praise to any of us, he is God and he is real. And when you seek him with an open heart, he will then show you that he's more real than you can imagine for the glory of Christ. So now, what are your questions? I'm here to try to answer. Um, so I guess to start off, there's a lot of different answers to this. Is the Bible like, is it the inspired word, like humans wrote it down? Yes. Or is it the word of God? Like, God yes, you know. That's the thing. When you say inspired by God through man, obviously, if you read the Bible, the books of the Bible, you'll see that Paul writes differently from Peter. Peter writes differently from John. Moses writes differently from Isaiah because the Bible fully incorporates the human persons, personalities, 
when communicating God's words, because God, <clears throat> we can't comprehend him. We're not on his level, but God who created all languages is able to <clears throat> come to our level and communicate on our level in his love. So what better way to communicate to humans than to speak through human agents by inspiration where the Holy Spirit guides them to speak the words that God wants to be spoken, but using their personalities to communicate that so you can understand. I mean, what better way? It's like you are a parent and you have a five-year-old. The way you speak to your five-year-old is not going to be the same as the way you speak to your 10-year-old. And it's not going to be the same as the way you speak to your 20-year-old, right? You're going to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And your love for some God who is almighty and infinite, he's speaking to human creatures. So what better way to communicate than to raise up humans who are moved by the Spirit to speak God's words, but using their personalities and their expressions to do so. So this is why we believe the Bible is truly human and truly divine. It's not eternal in the sense that it's not uncreated. We don't have the view that Muslims are the Quran. It is a production of God creating human vessels filled with the Spirit to communicate what God wants us to know through human language. It's a picture of Christ because Christ is truly divine, truly human. But the difference is Jesus is the uncreated word of God and he became man. So he's God in flesh, the God man. So the Bible is divine in that God is the one moving the authors to write down what God wants to be written down. So that's why it's his words, but using their human personalities to do so. This is our view of inspiration. All right, I got you. Um, now, before you move on, you understand that the Muslimic view of dictation creates problems for them because if the Quran is divinely dictated, where Muhammad's personality is not incorporated, that creates a host of problems because the Quran is full of ambiguities, inconsistencies, contradictions. And ask any scholar of the Arabic language who's not a Muslim, because many Muslims will cover up the fact, but just should I understand. Ask anyone who's a scholar of the Arabic language that's not a Muslim, are there Arabic <clears throat> incongruities where the Arabic is imperfect or inaccurate, grammatical mistakes? They'll tell you this. There's over 100. So that either means Allah cannot speak Arabic, because remember, it's divinely dictated, or it's not divine dictation. It's simply a production of an imperfect Arab who spoke Arabic imperfectly and wrote Arabic imperfectly. But you wouldn't know that because you don't know Arabic. That's why I'm saying ask scholars of Arabic are not Muslims. For example, there was a scholar of Arabic named Ali Dashti, an Iranian who wrote a book, but it was published after his death. Muhammad, 23 years. I have clips from him where he says, and he knew Arabic. He talks about the ambiguities, the grammatical mistakes of the Quran. In fact, that you'll find that the gender and the concord meaning. When you look at the Arabic verb, the gender of the verb doesn't match the noun doing the action, or it won't even match <clears throat> the concord so that you have a singular noun, but then you have a plural verb. It's full of those kind of mistakes, but you'd have to know Arabic to know that. So now I ask the Muslims, since you believe the Quran is divinely dictated, is Allah speaking bad Arabic? Because remember, there's no human personality involved in the production of the Quran, right? Well, from what I understood, when they say that it's that it's inter uh, eternal and divine, is that the words spoken are eternal and divine. You know, what I mean, Allah like, speaks poor Arabic. Then that's my point. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the what was it the gender or whatever. Yeah, because, for example, if you have a singular subject and then you describe him perform an action, that's the verb. But the verb is plural. Well, if it's a singular subject, why do you have a plural verb? It's like it's a Sam. They went to the store. What do you mean, Sam? They went. Sam, he went to the store, right? Yeah. OK, but that's what you find in the Quran. What you find in the Quran are these grammatical errors where. The verbs, nouns don't match one another, and the number doesn't match. And I'm going to. Is that the Quran now in Arabic? Yes, or is that... the Quran. Quran you have today, the ambiguities are there. 
So that means they had four, 10 years to clean up the mistake, but they didn't do it because that's how the Quran came down to them. So who made those mistakes, Allah or the writer, the copyist? Because remember, there is no human personality involved, right? Yeah. So how do you explain those? And I'll get you an article so you don't think I'm making it up. You're going to see it. Let me just get it here. Some grammatical mistakes of the Quran. Here you go. Here you go right here. I'm going to give it to you in private chat and for the rest of you. And those who read Arabic don't need this. But here, you have a lot of people in the comment section that read Arabic. Now, because they're not Muslims, they're not going to lie to you. They're in the comment section. You guys who speak Arabic, who love Jesus, and know you can't lie. Am I lying about the grammatical errors in the Quran? They'll tell you. And they'll give you examples. They'll read the Arabic. But see, you're at a disadvantage. I'm at a disadvantage. Why? Because I'm not Arab. I do not <clears throat> speak Arabic. I'm a Syrian, but I was raised in America. And therefore, you and I are at disadvantage. But the native Arabic speakers, those who are not Muslims, they laugh at the Quran. They go, this is a joke. Here, look at the comment section. So you go, not one bit. You're not lying. And they'll point them out to you. But see, this is where you're at a disadvantage. You're American. You don't know Arabic. So they play with you and deceive you and pull a fast one. Not with the Arabs or those who speak Arabic. They laugh at the Quran. They think it's a joke. Now, here is my article. I just gave it to you in private chat. Here you're going to see examples I give of their Arabic grammatical mistakes, acknowledged even by Muslims in the past. And I quote Ali Dashti. Let me see, explain to you. what. Look what he says. Okay, Ali Dashti. 23 years, a study of the prophetic career of Muhammad. This book, you should have it. But if you don't, I'm going to read what he says here. Okay. Let me show you a quote from him. And we'll continue. So we have time. Don't feel like you're pressed for time unless you don't have much time. No, no. I'm good. I want to get you his, his words. He was a Muslim. I don't know if he died a Muslim. I don't know if he became what they call a murtad. He became an apostate. I don't know. But I can tell you that in this book, he knows Arabic. And he says there are grave errors in the Arabic Quran. Let me show it to you. I just want to get this quote. I have it. One second. All right. Okay. Now ask me your next question as I find the quote for you because I don't want to. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I guess to get into the Bible a little bit then. Do you believe that there's errors in the Bible at all? It depends on what you mean. If there are, you mean transcriptional errors where through transmission copying errors have crept in? Yes. Well, I mean more like subject matter, like uh, historical what do you stuff mean? No. or no. contradictions. No, I don't believe that the Bible is historically inaccurate. No. In fact, apart from the Bible, much of ancient history is unknown. The Bible itself is an historical record. Why do you think that when archaeologists go and excavate, they use the Bible as their reference. This is not a lie. When they want to excavate Israel or they want to excavate, excavate let's say, <clears throat> Jerusalem or Nazareth, they use the Bible as one of their sources, if not their chief source, because the Bible <clears throat> mentions historical figures and places. So it becomes a guide for them to start excavating. Had it not been for the Bible, I would sincerely doubt there would be much emphasis in archaeologists going to Israel or the Middle East and start excavating. So the Bible itself is used as one of the primary, if not the primary sources, <clears throat> to try to reconstruct ancient history or to find places to dig and excavate. And that's not a statement of faith. I'm just That's a factual statement. Sure. Yeah. In fact, here, I'm going to mention to you a man named Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey. Okay, now, he was a skeptic. He did not believe in the Bible. He thought the Bible was full of errors. You can even Google his name, Sir William Ramsey. He spent 30 years in Asia Minor as an archaeologist because he wanted to find evidence to falsify the New Testament. And uh, this is not a lie. He wrote. It's He's on record. He wrote. He converted to Christianity because after spending 30 years in Asia Minor, looking at Luke and Acts, he specifically used the books Luke and Acts. After 30 years, he converted. He said, Luke is one of the greatest historians who ever lived. Whenever archaeology uncovered an inscription, whatever it is, <clears throat> regarding the events reported by Luke and Acts, Luke and Acts 
the author was always spot on. <clears throat> he was always accurate. And he should be considered one of the greatest historians that ever wrote. And he became a Christian. His name is Sir William Ramsey. He was an archaeologist. I'm not exaggerating. So put in Sir William Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y. He started as a skeptic. After three years, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. Because he said, this, this writer is historically accurate. He knew minutia, details that later generations could not have known if they were living at that time. And he documents it and he details it. And because of this historicity of Luke and Acts, that led him to trust what he said about Jesus and the exploits of the apostles in establishing the church. With the Quran, however, you cannot give me the historical context of the Quran. This is why you need the traditions that come 100 to 200 years after the Quran supposedly was written. Are you aware of this? Say that again. The Quran, if you just take the Quran, you just take the Quran and you have nothing else. Okay. Mm -hmm. You just take the Quran. You cannot tell me <clears throat> when the Quran was composed and by whom. It doesn't give you an historical context. This is why you're dependent. You are dependent on traditions that come over 100 years after when the Quran re was reportedly composed. For example, if I tell you. Do you mean like the hadiths and all that? Yes, that's what you need. Because if I say, show me in the Quran when the Quran was composed. Can you show it to me? Even so. Uthman can't show it to me. Neither Sneeko, because they, they can. It's not in the Quran. And if I say, who is Muhammad? Because the name Muhammad appears only four times in the Quran. Only four times. Okay, you with me there? Uh, you cut out. No, because you fell off. You you dropped the connection. Are you back? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. The name Muhammad only appears four times in the Quran. Only four times. So now if I asked you, who is this Muhammad? When was he born? Show me from the Quran. You can't. And whenever the Quran mentions prophet, say, O prophet, say, how do you know who's being addressed? Who's the prophet? You'd say Muhammad. I go, where'd you get that from? Where does it say Muhammad? I'll give you an example. Now, by the way, I sent you another article. Here it is. Save these articles and go study. See if I'm lying. Here's yeah, another I'll, one. I'll give them. You see the links? Now, let me read what Ali Deshti said about the grammatical mistakes of the Quran. Are you ready? Yeah. And I'm going to give you examples why I say the Quran does not give you its history. The Quran does not tell you the historical context leading to the composition of this book. It doesn't situate itself in history. You don't know when. Okay, when was, you don't know. Now, I'm going to now put it on the screen for everyone. This is in that article, guys. Save the links. Ali Deshti, what does he say about the grammar of the Quran? Now here, quote, the Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries. And he's absolutely spot on. Foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning. And by the way, in the articles, I quote Muslim sources admitting this. In the article, you'll see the citations by Muslim sources. And words used with other than the normal meaning. Adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender number. They don't agree. Illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns, which sometimes have no referent. You don't know what it's referring to. And predicates, which in rhyme passages are often remote from the subjects. You don't even know where the subject is. It's so far distant into the text. These and other such aberration, aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. The problem also occupied the minds, right, of devout Muslims. It forced the commentators to search for explanations and it was probably one of the causes of disagreement over readings. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean that without these, not make heads or tails out of the Quran. I'm just going to give you a few. I want you to see what the Muslims are not telling you. What they're not telling you. Because either they don't know or they're deceiving you. And this is a fact. I'm not lying. You can easily go back and then test me by asking a scholar these questions. See how he's going to answer you. Can he answer you from the Quran? He can't do it. 
and he's going to come up with some lame excuse. But here, I'm going to show you. I'm going to just show you one verse, and I want you to tell me what this is referring to. Chapter 17, verse 1. And I can give you example after example after example. But here you go. Watch here. Chapter 17, verse 1. Glorified be he who carried his servant by night from the inviolable place of worship to the far distant place of worship, the neighborhood whereof we have blessed, that we might show him of our token. Lo, he, only he is the hearer and the seer. Now, this says inviolable place of worship. Well, it really means, it says masjid, mosque. So if I asked you, it says glorify be who carried his servant. Who's the servant? Who's the servant? I mean, I assume Muhammad, but I guess there's no context. Prove it. So this yeah. is what I would say to Uthman Sneeko. Prove it. Show me it's Muhammad. Show me it's Muhammad. Open up the chapter. Read the entire chapter. Show me it's Muhammad. Secondly, just from the Quran. Where is the inviolable place of worship? Masjid al-Haram. From the Quran, show me where this place is. They'll tell you, oh, it's uh, Kaaba. Mecca. Where do you see that in the verse? Where does the verse say Mecca or Kaaba? Where did you get that from? And then he was taken to the far distant place of worship. Where is the far distant place of worship? Distant place from what location? Okay? Mm -hmm. You can't answer that, can you? Because the Quran has no context. Even when it tells you Muhammad, who is this Muhammad? When was he born? Where did he minister? The Quran is a joke. The real miracle is that people think the Quran is a miracle. This is why they're always quoting to hadiths, narrations, because they can't give you this information from the Quran. I'll give you one more example, then you can ask questions. But these are things they're not going to tell you. Chapter 111, 111, chapter 111. I hope the connection works. It's not working now. And, uh, hold on. Mm. All right, I'm going to probably have to use another browser. Sorry, sometimes Satan tries to mess things up. Lord Jesus, rebuke the evil one, destroy all distractions, and give us illumination illumination by your Holy Spirit. For the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yeah, I'm sure. Yep, let me go to another crown browser. Sorry, brother, brother in humanity. Hopefully you'll be a brother in Christ. Let me just go here. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It sucks. All right, let me go here. Chapter 111 of the Quran. I'm going to show you. Let me just do this. I'm going to use another browser. Thank the Lord for all these browsers. All right. I'm going to go to chapter 111. 111. 111. And I'm just going to use, let's see, the clear translation or let's see, word for word. I'm going to use the word for word, okay? Word right. for word translation. 111. Let's go here. Okay. Here it is. Here's the link. I'm going to show everyone here the link. Here's it in private for you and save the articles. Go back and study them when you have time to meditate on these things. So here it is for everyone else. Right there. I'm going to read for you. Now I'm going to read what it says. Perish the hands of Abu Lahab. Notice the man's name is Abu Lahab. Perish the hands of Abu Lahab. Not will avail him his wealth and what he earned. His wealth and won't avail him. He will be burnt in a fire of blazing flames, and his wife, the carry of firewood, in her neck will be a rope of palm fiber. Who's Abu Lahab? Who is he? I don't know. Like I said, I don't, I don't know enough, to be honest. No, it's not only you, I'm telling you. Ask anyone. Say, from the Quran, can you tell me who Abu Lahab is? They'll say, oh, Uncle Muhammad, say, where did you get that from the Quran? Oh, that's the Hadith. No, but I asked you from the Quran, can you tell me who this is? They can. What did this man do? And what was the crime of his wife that got Allah so angry that he even recited a chapter that's supposedly uncreated? Remember, these are the words of Allah, right? Yeah. So, and they're uncreated, right? Because the Muslim position, the Sunni position of Uthman Fibin and sneakers. The Quran is uncreated. It's kalam Allah. It's the speech of Allah. It has no beginning. So you want me to believe that these words are uncreated. They never began. So that in eternity, Allah was busy cursing someone who didn't exist yet. Why? What did he do? 
Why is Allah so concerned about this guy who didn't even exist? And he's cursing him already in eternity before he's born, before he's created. Well, what did the, the uh, Hadith say did? The, the Hadith say that this is Muhammad's uncle who didn't believe in him when he said that he's a prophet. But that's the Hadith that come over 100 years later. Can you show me that from the Quran? Anna, so I get the point you're making with the Hadith, but the so the Bible is like sparsed out a lot of time too. So Bible uh, what? The Bible, the books of the Bible are sparse, sparsed out hundreds of years. Well, yeah, well, but you're you're but. comparing apples and pineapples because you're ignorant about the Bible. Who told you the Bible is one book? The Quran is one book, right? Yeah. So why are you comparing a collection of books with one book? You compare book by book. You're comparing yeah. apples and pineapples. Yeah. So why is it that one book is so confused and chaotic that you can't make sense out of it? And then you want to then contrast that with over 70 books written over 1,500 years by different men in different time periods. So you're going to compare that and think that's analogous? No, no, I, I got what you're saying. So my question is, the Quran is more recent, right? Yeah. And some of the books of the Bible are very ancient. They're even before the time of Christ, correct? Yeah. So, of course, we who are coming way after may have some difficulties with some, not all, because oftentimes the Bible gives you enough context to situate itself. But you're talking about ancient books, some of which are even older than when Christ appeared on earth, and yet Christ confirmed those books. So, obviously, because we're far removed, we may not understand, but because of archaeology, and excavations, every archaeological dig found thus far, and I'll give you a link, it's called Expedition Bible, so you don't think I'm exaggerating. Even archaeologists who are not Christians will tell you there is yet to be found one archaeological inscription that falsifies the Bible history. What they argue from is silence. Well, we don't have any evidence for this person ruling or evidence for this event, but that's an argument from silence. Just because you don't have evidence yet doesn't mean it didn't exist. And why don't you trust the Bible as being that evidence? Because it's also historical record. But why do I have a problem with the Quran understanding its context when it's even younger in time? It's only, what, if we say it was composed in the 7th century, 600 years after Christ, that means it's not as old as the books of the New Testament, not as old as the books of the Old Testament, and yet you still can't make sense out of it. So don't compare a collection of books with one book. Compare book by book. Compare Luke with the Quran. And Luke passes with flying colors, and yet the Quran makes no sense. But the question I asked you, you didn't answer. Here's my question again. That wasn't the point. My question, I'm repeated. If you're following sneakers and Uthman Fibin, okay, they believe the Quran is uncreated. It's the speech of Allah, the speech of Allah, meaning it is one of his attributes, has no beginning. So I want you to convince me that before creation in eternity, Allah was already cursing people who did not exist to hell and made that part of his speech, which has no beginning. Well, uh, if it's eternal, then... Um, well, I mean, I think the response would be was is the um, Muslims believe that the that the whole, everything that has happened has basically already happened and that God has written everything. Oh, so Allah point. already determined that Abu Lahab, okay, you fell out again. So you keep falling out, losing connection. So Allah already, Sorry, determined, I'll check my... Allah already determined that Abu Lahab and his wife would be created so they can go to hell. Okay. So what you believe, that's fine. If you can live with that, go ahead. I hope it makes you sleep better at night. So what's your next? Like question? I said, I'm not here to debate too hard. I'm just no, it's okay. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, not, I'm asking questions so you can wake up by the power yeah. of Lord Jesus Christ. Because you left the Jesus you don't know to follow Muhammad, you don't know. You don't know Jesus, and you left him without knowing him, and you're now following Muhammad, you don't even know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what's the other question? Um I, earlier I asked if there was like errors, and you disagree with that, but um historical mistakes is different from transcri transcriptional errors and consistency demands if you find so-called discrepancies in the text and that's why you're not following christ you got to then burn your quran or flush it in the toilet because it's full of contradictions so you're going to be consistent though across the board or you're going to say well 
here are some alleged discrepancies in the Bible. But when it comes to the Quran and all its errors, I'm going to try to harmonize them. That means you're being dishonest if you apply that method. But I know you're not dishonest, so you're not going to use that method, right? Well, I don't know how many errors, like historical errors there are on the Quran. I mean, there's there's so many. I have to double check that. There are many. Can you give me some? Oh, uh, very easy. You sure you want to go that route? Uh, look, I'm not here to bait. I just no, I understand. I mean, it's up to you. Very easy. We've documented yeah. over 100. I was, okay. I In the first place, which came first, according to the Quran? What was created first, the heavens or the earth? Um, I'm not talking about science. Put science aside. I'm talking about, according to the Quran, what did Allah create first? I think it was the heavens, right? No. No? Yes. See, it's yes and no because the Quran contradicts itself. See, you're not following me. The Quran says the earth was created, then heaven, but then another place says the heaven was created, then the earth. But then it says the earth was created and its nourishments, then the heaven. But one place says the heaven was created and the earth nourishments was created afterwards. So which narrative do you want to follow? I guess you got an article on it, right? Yeah, I have a lot. I'll show you. But let me show it to you right here in detail. So it depends on depends on which surah you're reading here. Chapter 2, verse 29. And they're going to play games with the Arabic. But I have articles showing you that even the Muslim scholars say this is what it means. So here you go. Chapter 2, verse 29, for your benefit. He it is who created for you all that is in the earth. Then, thumma, then, turned he to the heaven and fashioned it as seven heavens. So what came first? The earth, then seven heavens. Well, if you want to reject science, that's okay. But people, keep, Muslims keep telling me that the miracle of the Quran is that a scientific miracle. Now, if that's true, according to modern theories of the origin of the universe, can you name any scientist that says the earth was created, then the heavens? And if the earth was created, where was it situated? Because the earth is in space. And can you show me any scientist that says there are seven heavens? But let's put science aside. I'm going to show you the Quran destroys itself. He it is who created for you all that is in the earth. Then turned he to the heaven. Then he turned to heaven and fashioned it as seven heavens. And he is the knower of all things. That was chapter 2, verse 29. Chapter 2, verse 29. Now, let's read chapter 41, verses 9 to 12. You with me so far? Yeah. Okay, now count. Because I know you and I know math. 41 verses 9 to 12. Here you go. Say, O Muhammad, unto thy doctors, disbelieve ye. 49 verses, 41, I'm sorry, 41 verses 9 to 12. Disbelieve ye verily in him who created the earth in two days. Now count with me. It says the earth in two days. Okay. And ascribe ye unto him, rivals, he and none else is the Lord. Right? Let me see if we skip something. The Lord. All right, see, so yeah, yes. here in London says the Lord of the worlds. He placed therein, now watch, firm hills rising above it and blessed it and measured its sustenance in four days. Created the earth in two days and its sustenance, sustenance, meaning the nourishment, the water, the mountains in four days, right? Mm -hmm. How many days is that? Two plus four. Six. Okay, all like for us. Now watch. Now he turns his attention to heaven. Now notice the heaven is smoke. It doesn't exist as seven heavens. So when the earth is being created, right, in six days, two plus four, six, right? The heaven is still smoke. Watch here. Then, then, Thumma turned he to the heaven when it was smoke. So there was no heavens. It was still smoke. And said unto it and unto the earth. So notice the earth is already existing. So the heaven is smoke, earth is existing, come together, meaning they were separate. Well, where, where the hell was the earth situated then if it's not in the heaven? But that's another story. Come both of you willingly or loth. They said we come obedient. Then he ordained them seven heavens in two days and inspired in each heaven its mandate. And we decked the nether, the lower heaven, with lamps and rendered it inviolable. That is the measuring of the mighty the knower. So, earth created two days, four days to create the earth's nourishments, provision, sustenance, like mountains. So, two plus four, that's six. Then, heaven was smoke. Heaven was smoke. And then told the smoke and the earth to come together. Then he made heaven 
seven heavens in two days. So two plus four plus two is what? Eight. Eight, right? Mm -hmm. But also in the Quran says, Allah created the heavens and earth in six days. So which is it? Let me show you. So did he created it in eight days or six days? Here, 754. So can you help me understand which it is here? Chapter 7, verse 54. But then it's going to get worse. 754. Lo, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Heavens and the earth in six days. Then mounted he the throne. He covereth the night with the day, which is in haste to follow it. And hath made the sun and the moon and the stars subservient by his command. His verily is all creation and commandment. Blessed be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Here it says six days, but it's not the only place it says six days. Here's chapter 10, verse 3. Chapter 10, verse 3. You with me so far? Yeah, I got you. Here you go. Chapter 10, verse 3. Lo, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Another passage says six days. Then he established himself on the throne, directing all things. There is no intercessor with him, save after his permission. That is Allah, your Lord, so worship him. Oh, will ye not remind? Okay, hold on. You still not, not clear here. Chapter 11, verse 7. But then uh, this problem is far from over, buddy. I'm just showing you one very clear contradiction, but we're going to show you more. And he it is who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now, that's the third passage that says six days. And his throne was upon the water that he might try, try you, which of you is best in conduct. Yet if thou, Muhammad, sayest, lo, ye will be raised. Again, after death, those who disbelieve will surely say, this is not but mere magic. So how many passages says six days so far? You count? Three, Three right? Mm -hmm. Oh, but hold on. We got another one. What? Chapter 25, verse 59. Say what? Now here's the fourth one. 25, verse 59. Who created the heavens and the earth and all that is between them in six days? Now pay attention. Everything in them. All that is between them in heaven and earth in six days. So they can't try to get around this. Then he mounted the throne, the beneficent, ask anyone in form concerning him. All right, so that's four so far, right? Yeah. Oh, but wait, we got a fifth one. Chapter 32, verse 4. Chapter 32, verse 4. Allah it is who created the heavens and the earth and that which is between them. So again, Everything in heaven and earth in six days. Then he mounted the throne. Ye have not beside him a protecting friend or, or mediator. Will ye not then remember? No, I guess Allah didn't remember because he forgot. Was it two plus four plus two or was it six? Oh, but we're not done yet. How many is that so far? What is that? Four or five? Five. Oh, but here's a sixth one. Chapter 50, verse 38. Six passage, chapter 50, verse 38. And verily, we created the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, everything in them, in six days, and not of weariness touched us. That was six, right? Yeah, what was the, can you go back to the first verse that was, uh, that said eight? The what? Can you go back to the first yeah, verse? Yeah, we'll get that to that because that's going to destroy chapter 79. But before you run to that, because I'm going to nail you on this, you're going to have to focus on this and address it. Here's the magic number seven. Oh, the seventh verse that says Allah created six days. 57 verse four. He it is who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Then he mounted the throne. All right. Now, let's see if you're going to follow the sequence of 41 verses 9 to 12. I know you're trying hard to say, no, no, but it can be harmonized. But conveniently for the Bible, you can't harmonize it. Remember I said be consistent or you're going to be dishonest. And I don't like dishonest people. So, but I know you're not. I know you're better than that. You're better than Muhammad. So here you go. 41. We're going to read 41 verses 9 to 12. And I know you're going to pay attention, right? Yep. Okay. Let's do the math again. And I'm going to show you how they try to get around it and how to destroy that argument. Here you go. 41 verses 9 to 12. Say, O Muhammad, unto the idolaters, disbelieve ye verily in him who created the earth in two days? And ascribe ye unto him, unto him rivals. He and none else is the Lord, right? 
He, none else, is the Lord of the worlds. He placed therein firm hills, rising above it, and blessed it, and measured therein its sustenance in four days. So you caught that, right? Earth two yep. days, and its measurement, sustenance hill in four days? Yep. Alike for all who ask. Okay, so that's so far two plus four, six. But now let's continue 11 to 12. Pay attention to the text. So they don't tap this around this. Then turned he to the heaven when it was smoke. So when the earth was being created in six days, heaven was smoke. It's right there. And said unto it and unto the earth. So the earth is already there because you can't talk to the earth if it's not there. Hey, smoke. Hey, earth. So the earth is already there. Come, both of you. You can't say to two things come if one of those two things don't exist. So I want you to see what's in front of your eyes. Willingly or loth. They said we. They said we come. Obedient. Then he ordained, he ordained them seven heavens in two days. Now do the math for me. Yeah. Okay. So do the math. Two plus four plus two is what? Hello? Yeah. Two plus four plus two is what? Do the math for me. I'm not good at math. Eight. But I just gave you seven verses in the Quran that says, Allah created heavens and everything in them in six days. Yeah. Now, if you were paying attention, did Allah create the nourishment, the sustenance of the earth before heaven was made into seven heavens? Yeah. You sure, right? Yeah. Not according to chapter 79, verses 27 to 33. It says, heaven was created and then earth's nourishments afterwards. So I'm going to ask you to try to reconcile this because I'm baffled, dude. And then since they appeal to science, do you know of any scientist that says, any scientist that says the earth was fashioned when there was no space, when the heaven was still smoke? I'm not big. I'm not big into the whole science argument. To yeah, but with. no, they are. Uthman Fibin, the one that influenced you in sneakers, they appeal to as the scientific miracle of the Quran. So I guess they did a bad job of deceiving you, but that's okay. May God save you. Now watch this. Are you ready? You ready now for this one, right? Yeah. Chapter 79, 27 to 33. Now, remember you read and you just said, and you admit it, that the earth's nourishments, sustenance, like Mount, was created when there Before the heaven. was still smoke, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but now we got a problem. 79, 27 to 33. Are ye the harder to create, or is the heaven that he built? He raised the height thereof, and ordered it, and he made dark the night thereof, and he brought forth the morning thereof. Now watch. And after that, afterwards, that he spread the earth, after he had raised the heaven and made dark and morning, and produced therefrom the water thereof and the pasture thereof, and he made fast the hills, a provision for you and your cattle. Now, help me make sense out of this. Was the sustenance, the provision of the earth, created when heaven was smoke and earth was already existing? And then he took the smoke and made it seven heavens? Or did he already deck the heaven and then created the earth's nourishments afterwards? I don't know. Yeah, neither do the Muslims. They'll do the tap dance. But in the articles, I even quote Muslim scholars like Muhammad's cousin, Ibn Gas says, Ibn Abbas, who says, yeah, these passages are difficult. I don't know how to reconcile them. That's what it is. Even Yusuf Ali, a Muslim commentator, says, this is difficult, right? So my point is, for a Muslim to attack the Bible for alleged dis discrepancies and refuse to allow a Christian to harmonize, this is the most wicked satanic thing because that shows they're dishonest because when we point out errors and contradictions in the Quran, they try to harmonize them and want us to accept their harmonization. Equal weights and measures. And the other problem you have by attacking the Bible, and I'm going to give you another contradiction, is that the Quran says Jesus confirmed the Old Testament that he was reading at his time, and that Muhammad confirmed the very Bible that the Jews and Christians are reading at his time, which are the very scriptures that contain these alleged contradictions. So that means the Muslims know more than Allah and Muhammad. So why are they Muslims? I can expect an atheist, except an atheist, expect an atheist to argue this way, not a Muslim. 
That's dishonest. Now, you want me to give you more errors? I'll be happy. Nah, that's nah, that was enough. Okay. So put aside these stupid arguments. The real issue is the nature of God and Christ. Why did you leave the Jesus of the Bible for the Jesus of Islam, the God of the Bible for the God of the Quran? Because that's what the real issue is. You went to Islam because you thought that's a true God. Why? Um, to be honest, the primary thing was the Trinity. That was exactly. the, there's like some other smaller things, but that was probably that's fine. I'm sure you get that all the time. That was no, the Trinity is fine, but yeah. Now that you realize that you went to Islam and that Muslims are not Unitarians, you realize that now, right? Because you said you had a problem with the Trinity, which we'll adjust, I promise. We'll go into all the verses. But I want to, again, want, scratching my head, I'm wondering, why in the world then did you embrace Islam when they have their own form of the Trinity and Islam is paganism? Well, I've, I think I've seen your video on this before. It's... um the quran is like one of the parts of the trinity and then his his soul or his body is the other part no not soul and body i never said that i said the quran is uncreated right yeah yeah but the quran is it allah no all and right so, I, I think the how they explain it is his speech so i guess it would okay so but if it's a speech what what in the world is the quran doing speaking to allah but you're you a sunni muslim so you follow sunni islam and the hadith say that the quran will come and the chapters of the Quran will come arguing and interceding with Allah for those that recited it. So Allah speaking to himself? Uh, how they how I've heard that one explained is that it's like it's what? Um, how I've heard that one explained is that it's it's like metaphorical, like it's not gonna Who come told as you it's person? metaphorical? I don't care what they say. Muhammad didn't say it's metaphorical. He said, You will see the the surahs, chapter two and three, coming either as shades or clouds or two flocks of birds. So are they now improving Muhammad's speech and explaining what Muhammad did not say? Is that how they duped you? Muhammad says, you will see, they will come. They will come either as two shades or two clouds or two flocks of birds, and they will plead with Allah on behalf of those that recited it. He even says they're going to have a shape. That's not metaphorical. So you can see them visibly. So again, answer my question. I, I know they try to tap dance because they're dishonest, but I know you're not dishonest unless you're completely gone, and I pray you're not. There's still hope for you. If the Quran is a speech of Allah, what in the world is the Quran doing speaking to Allah? Is that Allah speaking to himself? I guess it would have to be then. I don't, I don't know. And you're okay with that because you had a problem with the Trinity, but you don't have a problem with that? I mean, I have questions about that now, yeah. Now, my other question is, okay, it's a speech of Allah. But the Quran is also a book. It's a kitab. It says, we sent down to you the book, the kitab. So the Quran is not just the speech. It also becomes a book in liberation, kitab. So did a part of Allah become a book? I don't, I don't know. Exactly, because these are things they don't tell you. Oh, Allah's one. Ahad, ahad, ahad. Yeah, I know. That's what they say. Which is a lie from the pit of hell. What do they tell you about the spirit? Who's the spirit? Uh, no, that I heard that from... I thought I heard that from you. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I don't know. I thought I heard... When you were... I, heard, I saw a video of you discussing this, and I thought like the other third was the spirit, but I never heard anything about that yeah. from the Muslims. If you, ask, if, you ask, if you ask sneakers, and if you ask Uthman Fibin, they'll tell you the spirit is Angel Gabriel. That's what they'll tell you. And are you talking about the Holy chance. Spirit or the Spirit from the? Because I thought you made it. I thought you made an argument that part of the Allah is like a Trinity in of Himself, and the third head is His Spirit or whatever. Yeah, but they'll tell you the Spirit, Ruh, Ruh al Qudus, Ruh al -Al Alamin, the faithful Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit. That's Gabriel. That's what they'll tell you. They'll say it's angel. Gabriel, Jibreel, alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to challenge the Muslims because I've debated them. I've written responses to their arguments. <clears throat> I'll come on your channel. Here. Sneakers. Uthman Fibin. Here it is. Clip it. Send it to him. I'll come on your channel mm -hmm. and I'll debate you on the Quran to see if the spirit is Gabriel. And secondly, I will take Protestant believer 
to the nearest mosque and make him take shahada if they can show me that Gabriel is the spirit in the Quran. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Nowhere does the Quran say Gabriel is the spirit. The Quran is quite clear. The spirit is breathed out by Allah. The spirit is this thing from angels. He's not an angel because angels come down with the spirit, go up with the spirit. The spirit accompanies them. They're not one and the same. And the spirit can appear as a man and create and give life. That's chapter 19, verses 16 to 21. In the Quran? Mm -hmm. Let me show it to you. See, these are things they're not going to tell you. Okay? These are things they're not going to tell you. Okay? And I have like over a dozen articles and debates on this topic. But here, I'm going I'm to tell you because they're not going to tell you. They'll say, oh, this is Gabriel. Where does it say Gabriel? It says spirit. Be careful of translations that say we sent to her our angel. It's our ruh, ruh ana, ruh, spirit. So here it is, chapter 19, verses 16 to 21. Okay, 19, 16 to 21. So here you go. Let's put it here. And make mention of Mary in the scripture when she had withdrawn from her people to a chamber looking east and had chosen seclusion from them. Then we sent unto her our spirit. Ask any Arabic reader. What's the word here? It's ruh. Ruh. Ruh means spirit. We sent her our spirit, and it assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. So God's spirit appears as a man. She said, lo, she didn't know it was the spirit. She thinks it's a man trying to do something. Lo, I seek refuge in the beneficent one from thee. In other words, if you fear Allah, stay away from me. If thou art God free. Now look what he says. He said, I'm only a messenger of thy Lord, right? I'm only a messenger of your Lord, but what? That I may bestow on thee, I may give you a faultless son. So he's saying, don't be afraid. I've come to give you a faultless son. In other words, he's going to cause Mary to conceive Jesus in her womb. She said, how can I have a son when no mortal hath touched me? Neither have I been unchaste. What do you mean? How am I going to have a child? He said, so it will be thy Lord saith, right? It is easy for me, and it will be that we may make of him a revelation. We're going to make him a revelation for mankind, a mercy from us, and in his thing ordained. So again, if you missed it, I'm only a messenger of the Lord, that I may give you, I will give you a faultless son. So not only Jesus faultless, sinless, even according to the Quran, even though it's not the real Jesus, it is the spirit who's going to cause her to conceive. So the spirit creates and he appears as a man and he can speak and he's not Allah, but he's a creator and life giver. So how many creators you got, man? Well, you could say that he was he was he was granted that from God, right? That You're only making that. my point. So Allah allowed the spirit to create and give life. So he made him a partner with him. That's not helping your case. That shows that Allah took him as a partner. Well, I mean, you could like, like how, I guess, like how Moses split the sea. Like he didn't do that. No, right? Moses but, didn't create and give life. And but, the fact that he lifted the rod, that rod by lifting it was a sign that by lifting the rod, God would then <clears throat> split the Red Sea. That's why the rod was in his hand, because this was a sign. This is God's staff. And by it, he will rule and judge. And when he lifts it, that is a summons to God who was there in the cloud. To split the Red Sea per the request of Moses. That's not the same thing. He comes and he gives her a, a son. In fact, 6612 says that Allah blew that spirit in her private part. Now, why did he enter a private part? That's 6612. Mary, who guarded her private part, her, I, I gotta be G rated, but ask any Arabic speaker here. Arab, Arab speakers, the word farj, farjaha. Farj. Mary guarded her farj. Farjaha. What does the word farj mean when you're speaking of a woman? Watch the comment section. Those who speak Arabic won't lie to you. And I'm going to give you a translation by Muslims that tell you that that word means her sexual organ. And Allah blew into it. See? Here you go. See this brother? He knows Arabic. So it says that your God Allah blew his spirit into her private part. Why? Why did the spirit enter a private part? To do what? 6612. Can you tell me why? No. 
because that's how he got her pregnant. That's the point. I came to give you a son. So I'm going to enter your body and cause you to conceive. He's the one causing the conception without male sperm. That means he is creating and giving life that only Allah is able to do so, no one else. You can't show me someone else doing that. And the spirit is coming out of Allah. It says we blew our spirit. So he's blowing the spirit out of him. It's coming out of him. So is so, there no evidence that the Holy Spirit is great Gabriel in the Quran None. At all? none. Give it to me. None. But even then, if you say it's Gabriel, that means Allah blew Gabriel out of himself into Mary. That's gave you nastier. So what is Gabriel doing inside her? I'll give you the translation by a Muslim so you don't think I'm lying. And if I go into the commentaries where they think it's Gabriel, because that's later tradition, that's not the Quran. So I said, I'll challenge anyone from the Quran, show me the spirit is Gabriel. They can't. So they go all about the Muslim scholars. I don't care what scholars say. Give me the Quran. Scholars can be right or wrong. But here, I'm going to show you a translation by a Muslim, not me. And I'll give you the link. Or they're going to tell you what the Arabic means. So you don't think we're lying. Because, oh, we're Christians. We're all, yeah. But the Muslims are all honest. Yeah, we know. So you left Jesus without knowing him and not knowing the Bible. Because you have problems with Trinity. And yet you're following this mishmash, this confusion. Allah, I'm not going to justify my conversion. I mean, no, I it understand. was kind of rushed, but yeah, yeah, it was rushed. Uh, you, you're right, it was rushed. But let me show you a translation. But it's never too late, buddy. As long as you have, you know, breath, you still have hope to return to the truth. And Islam is not the truth. And we can talk about the Trinity if you want. But here's the link, because I just want to show you: Islam is paganism. Islam is not Unitarianism, and Allah is not a singular person. He may even be multiple gods. Okay, now I right hear. Jerome, watch this. Here's the link, guys. Click on it. Now I'm going to show you this. Watch. This is a Muslim translation, buddy. It's not my translation. Click on it so you see I'm not lying. It's from Islam Awaken. Muhammad Samira translation, all right? Mm -hmm. Now watch how graphic and nasty it is because they're giving you the Arabic. You ready? Yeah. Guys, this is Muslim translation. And Mary Amran's daughter, who remained chaste, protected her genital parts between her legs. <laughs> yeah but then what did Allah do he blew into it so Allah is a vagina blower he blows into vaginas why there is right there yeah we blew in in it from our soul spirit it's not soul it's spirit and she confirmed what's true for the Lord's words expressions 66 12 now I gave you the link guys and his books and she was from worshiping from the worshiping humble one more time. Okay, you back? Because you keep falling. Yeah, hold on. I'm gonna disconnect. I might I might get disconnected, but I'll be back. All right. Okay, fine. You want to go and recharge and come back? Uh no, I think it's my internet. I might I'm gonna disconnect from it and go to my uh my 4G instead. Right. I might get disconnected. All right, that's fine, because I don't want to lose you. If you have to go somewhere else to get better connected, let me know. But here you go. One more time, so you can see this is a Muslim translation. They're telling you what the Arabic footage means. Mary Imran's daughter, who remained chaste, protected her genital parts between her legs. And even gets graphic between her legs. Well, I didn't know that the genital parts were between her legs. I thought genitals in, uh, in, in my ear. I mean, you have to be that graphic? Yeah, because that's the Arabic. Right. And we blew in it. Blew into what, my friend? What did he blow into, man? This is I mean, a I'm not going to say it. But, but wait, you're a Muslim, right? Why, aren't you, why are you embarrassed by your book? You're embarrassed by your own book? Now, I did a session on this on YouTube to embarrass Uthman Fibin. My, the name of my session is Allah, the Vagina Blower. Let me get you that link so you can watch it. I did a session on this. It's called Allah, the Vagina Blower. Because when Christian, when Muslims, mock, oh, your God came out of a woman's belly. Your God, in it, yeah, but your God loves to blow in women's vaginas. People living in glass houses should never throw stones. Because your glass house will come crumbling down. Let me get you that session, guys. Here it is. If you go and use the search engine, you put in Allah. Sorry, women. Vagina. And here it is. Uthman Farooq's Ilah. The vagina blower and satanic judge. Here it is. See here, my face looks very skinny. I pray I'm that skinny. Lord, please let my face look like that. I hope I'm not 
getting fat. Put, <laughs> see, I look my face, look lean. I hope I'm still that. Please, Lord, it's not my vanity. Okay, here's the art. Here's the session in response to Uthman. There it is, right there. You can go watch it. You'll see it right there. Uthman Farouk's Ila, the vagina born satanic judge. May the Lord destroy censorship and keep these videos up. So there you go. I'm not lying. I'm still waiting for Uthman to respond. Uthman Fibin. So you're not a Unitarian. Islam does not teach Unitarianism. Islam does not teach there's only one God. Islam teaches there's a multiplicity of gods, even though it says Allah is one. And the spirit is not a creature. The spirit is blown out of Allah, meaning that it comes out of Allah. It came out of Allah. Breathe. That means he's breathing it out of himself. Well, if it's coming out of Allah, then it's not created because nothing in Allah is created. So the spirit is uncreated, but the spirit can appear as a man. The spirit is subject to Allah and creates and gives life. Man, that sure sounds like the Quran has its own form of the Trinity, which is not the true Trinity, let alone all the other things I can show you. But again, uh, I prefer to help you with the Trinity because this is garbage. You want yeah, to talk I mean, about the I, I heard that. I was, I was, yeah. So I, can we move on to the biblical Trinity? Yeah, that's even better because I'd rather talk about the truth and the true God than this. But I just want you to not be deceived. That's all I'm bringing up. Do not be deceived. I guess I'll look, I'll look, I will look more into those articles. Yeah, I hope you do because if you... After hearing these facts, and you can see they're not going to refute it, they're going to tap dance, and you still follow, then I don't have to tell you, then you really you want to be deceived because Islam is not Unitarianism, let alone like if I mentioned kissing the black stone, the black stone comes to life, paganism from the pit of hell. But go ahead, let's talk about Trinity. I'm going to go off camera for a second because I got to do something. Go ahead. So, um, after watching your videos, <clears throat> um, I think I've seen enough evidence to suggest that Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. And especially, I did some research on the old church fathers, like, uh, yep. I forgot the name. I think it's Ignatius and Polycarp. Yep, exactly. They believed, they believed yeah. that he was God. Yep, and I have articles that showing that they do. And um, so I can accept, I, I think I can accept that, but I still understand how the Holy Spirit gets put into that equation. And I watched your video on it, and uh, maybe you can explain another way, but I didn't, I didn't find it super convincing well remember you and i are not the standard of what is true so if something's not convincing to you doesn't mean it's not true right so we're not the judge jury executioner but the reason why we know the spirit is creator god because he creates he gives life he sustains he regenerates things that god does and he's there before creation so that means he's not created and the second aspect is that the spirit speaks instructs can be grieved, so that means he's not a force. So when you combine the fact that the spirit is uncreated, he's eternal, we'll go through the verses, and he was there when creation came into being, and he was there creating and giving life, and he recreates and he resurrects and he preserves. These are qualities of God Almighty. And then he speaks and is spoken to, then he's not a force, then that means he's God. But then he's not the Father, not the Son. But they're not three gods, so what's the conclusion? that it's another person but i mean i just i kind of want to see the verses and see you explain them you. because yeah i'm gonna show it to you right now even though i've done so but i'll do it for you for your convenience so you can learn here let's go now step by step let's go step by step so yeah i'm just giving you a summation of because i just finished a, se a series trinity in the old testament and i did sessions years earlier on the holy spirit in the old testament but here i'm gonna show you let's take it step by step Right. I'm going to start with the Old Testament. So what Bible do you like? I mean, English translation, basically. Um, I think the most I read from was King James. Was that easy so, to read? Because if it's not, don't get stuck on a translation you cannot read. That one was not easy to read. OK, then don't go with King James. Go with in modern chat. So you can use new King James version, modern English version. You can use New American Standard Bible. You can use whichever one you want. I'm not. Yeah. Sure for now, to understand Bible. right now. Because all Bible translations are based on <clears throat> manuscripts where their translation will be anywhere from 93 to 97 percent uniform, meaning there are variant readings in a manuscript tradition, but that's with all books, even the Quran, so that you're going to be reading, <clears throat> let's say, NIV, New King James, and they're going to be giving you <clears throat> the same message, the same theology. 
because they're going to be translating her manuscripts that are over 90% uniform. Because then when you copy things by hand, you're not going to copy perfectly. But because we have nearly 30,000 copies of the books of the Bible in different languages, we know that the Bible has been preserved because it'd be humanly impossible for an individual to gather all these copies that were spread all over the world and change them or burn them like Uthman did with the Quran and then standardize the Bible version he liked. That's how we know God preserved his word. Unlike the Quran, in your tradition, it says, Uthman burned Arabic Qurans produced by Muhammad's companions, and he went with what he thought was the standard. One man. Thank the Lord we don't have that in our history. But be that as it may, read a translation that you're going to understand and work your way up. So I'm going to use Legacy Standard Bible only because it will translate a form of God's covenant name, Yahweh. So now let's look step by step. I'm going to ask you questions and you tell me. Uh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, twenty-three verses one to three. Second Samuel, twenty-three verses one to three. So here you go. Now these are the last words of David. So this is David, the prophet David, King David. David, the son of Jesse declares the man who was raised on high declares the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now watch the spirit of Yahweh spoke by me. You got it. Mm -hmm. So who is speaking to and through David? The spirit of Yahweh. So the spirit speaks, right? Yeah. And his word was on my tongue. So whose word is David recording? The spirit. But I thought the Bible is God's word. But then it says, the God of Israel said. So who spoke? God's spirit. No, right there it says the God of Israel. Oh, God. Yeah, Yahweh. So who spoke? God of Israel or the spirit of God? I guess, yeah. Yeah. Here, one more time. Look at verse 2. The spirit of Yahweh spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. But wait, he just said, it was the spirit of Yahweh that spoke, and it's his word that I'm communicating. But then he says, that's the God of Israel, the rock of Israel speaking through me. Yeah, but there's like, is yeah, the but, spirit in that context supposed to be distinct from God, or is it just... Spirit of God. God. Spirit, hmm, let me think. Spirit of God. Hmm. So why not just simply say God? Why spirit of God? Son of God. Spirit of God. What do you think? What do you think? I don't know. I think it could be like is it's just it's supposed to be God, but well, yeah, the know, spirit like, is God, but he it belongs to God. So you're confused. You're actually making my case. The spirit is God. But if you're saying it's the person, one person, then why say the spirit of God spoke? Why not just say God spoke? Why then distinguish the spirit from God if there isn't a distinction? I don't know. I mean, exactly. is there other places where it does that too? Or What? Does it do that in other places in the Bible yeah, too? It does or? a lot of places in the Bible. So for, for example, if it says the son of God was sent into the world, are you going to say, well, yeah, the son of God is God, the father appearing as a son. What would you say? Well, yeah, because I guess it's distinct. But So, OK, but now, well, no, you said distinct, right? Yeah. Well, now you're going to have to admit the spirit is not the same person as the father, because watch here. You, I'm going by what you just said. Here you go. Galatians 4. Verses 4 to 6. Now, tell me how you're going to get around this. And I'm not saying you're debating. But here, Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law. So now you're not going to say that the son is the father, because that's the son of the father. God sent forth his son of a watch, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now watch. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So are you going to say the spirit is the son? No. But it's the spirit of the son, right? Yeah. And who sent that spirit? The father. And now I'm going to show you that that's the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind, when God sent forth the spirit of his son, that spirit comes into me and makes me a son of God so I can call God my father, right? Yeah. Now, let me show you who that spirit is. The spirit of his son. Here it goes. Romans 
We're going to read 9 to 16. Now watch Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 16. Now pay attention. The spirit of his son is not the son, and God sent that spirit like he sent the son. So the son cannot be the father because the father sent him. The spirit cannot be the father because the father sent him. And the spirit of the son cannot be the son. Now watch them. Watch it. Romans 8, verses 9 to 16. This is why we're Trinitarians. You're going to see here. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Spirit of God. There it is, that reference again. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. Oh, so the spirit of God is the spirit of Christ. So are you telling me now that Jesus is the Father? Because if the Spirit is God the Father, and yet the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, so that Christ is God the Father, so you're a modalist? Explain. Come on, buddy. I'm waiting. I don't know, man. That's why we're Trinitarian. Just like the Spirit of Christ is not Christ, but the Spirit that belongs to Christ, then the Spirit of God is not God the Father, but the Spirit that belongs to God the Father. So the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Son, and that's the Holy Spirit sent by God and Christ to live in us. And when the Spirit lives in you, He unites you to Christ. That's why it says, <clears throat> if you do not have, have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Him, Christ. But if Christ is in you, so the Spirit comes and makes you one with Christ, unites you to Christ. So now, by the Spirit, Christ is in you. <laughs> Though the body is dead, because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will do what? Will also give light to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So just like the spirit of Christ is not Christ and the son of God is not God, the spirit of him, God, cannot be God the father, can it? Well, why why couldn't it be two spirits then? You know, because if it says Christ spirit and then are you Father's on drugs, spirit. my friend? Because Wait, what? it tells you are you on drugs? Because it says the spirit of Christ is a spirit of God who lives in you. It doesn't say two spirits. It says the spirit is in you, and that spirit is the spirit of God who's in you, and that spirit is the spirit of Christ in you, and that's the spirit that God will use to raise you from the dead. Are you doing drugs? Honestly, be honest with me. Are you like? No, I'm not doing drugs. Because only someone who's stoned could say, "Oh, that's two spirits." When the per point is, well, I must, I must have misread because I thought I said God's spirit and Jesus' spirit. Yeah, but that's where you're confused because the whole point of Paul is to tell you that the spirit belongs to God and Christ. It belongs to them both. That's why if the spirit of God is in you, that means it's the spirit of Christ in you. And that's why you have Christ in you. You want me to reread it again? Yeah, yeah. One more time, huh? Yes. This is what happens when you cite the crown, buddy. Or you kiss the black stone. This is what happened to your brains on the stone. Stay away from that black stone, bro. But here you go. There you go. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, I'm going to give you $10 million, and Protestant is going to take shot if you show me it's two different spirits. Follow the train of thought. But in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, are you going to say that's two different spirits? No. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, are you now going to say that's two spirits? Because it's saying that you have to have this spirit to belong to Christ. What spirit? The one that's in you. That's the spirit of God. That's the spirit of Christ in you. So now try to make that two spirits. I'm going to wait. Go ahead. We'll be waiting. No, I got you. I was just. Oh, because you just definitely. don't want to give in. It's all right, brother, man. You made a mistake. It's okay. You can repent. God will exalt the humble, but he'll humble the pride. He hates pride. So don't just argue because you want to be right. Man, give it up. Islam is false. But let's continue. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So notice, the spirit in you is the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. And if the spirit of Christ is in you, then he unites you to Christ. And now Christ is in you and with you. And that's the spirit of him who will then raise your body from the dead. Right? Right? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give light to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So now his spirit dwells in you, which is the spirit of Christ dwells in you. And if he dwells in you, he unites you to Christ. So now Christ is in you. But now watch. Remember, it says God sent forth his son and God sent forth his, the spirit of his son. So you cry out, Abba, Father, right? 
Mm -hmm. Now, let's see who that spirit is. Remember that word, Abba, Father, right? Yeah. Romans 8, verses 9 to 16. Watch here. Here you go. So then, brothers, we are under obligation, not to the flesh. We don't live for our fleshly desires, but live according. We don't live according to the flesh. We don't live for sin or pleasure. For if you are living according to flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit, if you're living by the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, submitting to the Spirit, you are putting to death the practice of body. You are overcoming sin, opposing sin, and seeking to live holy lives. Then you will live. For as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. But in Galatians 4, 6, it says, it's the Spirit of His Son that makes you a son of God, where you cry out, Abba, Father. But here it says, it's the Spirit of God that makes you a son of God. And that same Spirit is the one that makes you say, Abba, Father. Here it is. There you go. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. But in Galatians 4, 6, that spirit is the spirit of his son because it's that spirit that makes you cry, Abba, Father. But here it's the spirit of God and it's the spirit of Christ. So just like Christ is not the spirit and Christ is not the father, he's the son of God then the Spirit cannot be God the Father, but distinct from Him. And I'm going to give you more proof of that. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Spirit cannot be God the Father, nor can He be the Son, just like the Son cannot be the Father. But yet the Spirit is God who speaks and acts. Now here's more proof the Spirit is not God the Father. Watch, same chapter, Romans 8, 26 to 27. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Watch here. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's the same Spirit of Romans 8, 16. Remember here, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and that's the Spirit of God. Then later in that chapter, 26, it says that spirit intercedes for us, teaches us how to pray, what to pray for, and how to pray in accord with God's will, because we don't know what God's will is for, let's say, some situation in my life. But the spirit knows, and he'll move me to pray in accord with God's will for that circumstance in my life. But then it says this in 27, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is. Wait. If he who searches our, who searches your heart? Who's the one that searches hearts? Spirit. But no, not in here. Because the one who searches the hearts knows the mind of the spirit. So who searches the hearts? By God. Okay, God. But now explain to me how then the spirit can be God the Father. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So are you telling that God is saying that I know my own mind because I'm the Spirit? Because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit knows the will of God and God knows the mind of the Spirit. Are you telling me that the Spirit is God the Father? He just can't be. But... Okay. Now that's why we're Trinitarians. But if you still don't get it, here, let me show you another one. You ready? Well, I think I think I got like it's still kind of confusing, but I can get it is. I can get how the scripture. Well, well, you it, expect so. that an infinite mind you're going to fully comprehend it? That's not even Islamic teaching. Doesn't the Quran say Allah is unlike anything in creation? Yeah. In fact, even sneakers and Uthman. Just to show you again, you don't want to be inconsistent. You want to be honest. Uthman is on record saying he's a Salafi. He follows the Salaf Salih, and he'll tell you Allah has hands. He has a shin. He has a foot, he has eyes, he even wears an, an izar, a waist uh, garment, right? They are attributes befitting his majesty. They're not metaphorical, but we do not know how. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Yeah. So then why are you still a Muslim if confusion is a reason to reject the revelation of God in the Bible? I don't get it. So you're okay with 
Uthman, because you said you listen to sneakers, Uthman. Go. Oh, we have the clip. He's a Salafi. Salaf Salah. They'll tell you. Allah has two right hands. Unlike anything creation, but they are hands. We don't allegorize them. He has a foot. He has a shin. And we're going to recognize him by a shin because he's going to show us a shin on the day of judgment. I'll get you the hadith. Right? He wears a waist wrapper, an azar, to cover his gonads. He has at least two eyes. They are really characteristics of Allah, but they're unlike anything. We don't know how. Okay. Are you okay with that? Can you figure that out? Can you explain that well, to me? I didn't know about that. So then when you say it's kind of confusing, if that's your criterion to accept them, something, then just become an atheist agnostic. That's not a good argument because it cuts both ways, equal weights and measures. So if the Trinity is confusing, even though God says I'm beyond your ability to comprehend, you're going to see this is who I am, but you won't fully comprehend because then you'd be God to comprehend God in all his fullness and we're not God. Or reject Christian Islam, become a Buddhist, or become an atheist agnostic. But you can't consistently remain a Muslim with these kind of arguments. Doesn't work. But let me give you one more final line that the Spirit is not the Father and the Son, right? You ready? Yeah. And then we can go into another topic. Just as so you know, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. Here you go. John 14, 26. Let me just show you. Clearest example that the Holy Spirit is not the Father, not the Son. Watch here. John 14, 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Okay. If the Father sends Holy Spirit, is that the Father? No. And in my name, meaning for my sake, because of my authority, is Holy Spirit Jesus? No. How many is that? Three. Hmm, interesting. There are three, huh? Trevin, I just want you to know the Shia say your mother's life too. Trevin, sorry, this guy, he's very mind as his mother. She's live in Iran. She's at the Shia brothel doing muta to give birth to more dogs like you. Sorry, brother, because we got some demons. Here. But you got it, right? So there's three, right? Yeah. And he, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit has the power to enable you to recall and remember the teachings of God. And he can do that for everyone. He will remind you, all of you, of what I said. He will teach you everything. That means he knows all things, right? Yeah. So if he knows all things and he has the power to enable you to recall things about God that you learned in the past and recall them, and he does that for everyone, that sure sounds like qualities of God, right? Yeah. Okay, but no, Aaron, let me give you one more. John 15, 26. Again, to show you the Spirit is not God the Father. He's not the Son. But like the Father and Son, he's God in nature. That's why we're Trinitarians, because these passages. But here, John 15, 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Okay. If Jesus sends the advocate, who was the Holy Spirit, that means he's not the Holy Spirit, right? No. And if he sends him from the Father, that means he's with the Father, but he's not the Father, right? Yeah. Who proceeds from the Father. So he comes from the Father, but he's not the Father, right? Yeah. He will bear witness about me. So if the Spirit will now bear witness about Jesus, that means he's not Jesus. How many is that again? Three. All right. Now, final one. That's why we're Trinitarian. John 16, 12 to 13. Remember, Father and Son will send the Spirit? Yeah. Father sends the Spirit, and the Spirit is sent by the Son when he goes to the Father. So the Father and Son together will send the Spirit who's with the Father to testify about Jesus, and remind the disciples of Jesus' teachings? Well, now watch here. You want the clearest evidence that he's not the Father, he's not the Son, but he is a person <clears throat> who is God, who hears from the Father and the Son and can speak? Here you go. John 16, 12 to 13. Pay attention, 13. John 16, 12 to 13. I still have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he... The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Hears from whom? Who's he going to hear from? Well, it doesn't really say, but... Come on, we just read the verses. Do I have to go over them again? God. 
You remember John 14, 26? The Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name, and I will send them from the Father who will bear witness of me. Really? Yeah. He doesn't really say, are you kidding me? This is the same conversation. No, I got you. See, I know you're trying hard, man. Give up, brother, because it's your loss if you refuse, but it's your gain if you accept. So hear from whom? The Father. And who else? The Son. So he's not the Father, not the Son, right? Yeah. So you see why we're Trinitarians? Yeah. The, uh... What's the butt part? It's okay. I can, can give you more verses. Yeah, but now you want me to show you the Spirit creates? Uh, well, I guess my, I guess the objection I have left is like what the early Christians thought about the Trinity. Because I know it's like, from my limited early knowledge. Christians. You mean Ignatius and Justin? Yeah. yeah. You mean that they all taught that the Spirit and the Son are not part of creation, but they proceed from the Father? Well, I don't know too much about that, but yeah, I feel you go into that. You, know, you know what? I don't know too much about their writings. I just saw. Yeah, I have I have sessions and articles on all this. I have an article on the Holy Spirit being worshipped as God before Nicaea. I've done sessions on these, so I don't know. But now we go from the Bible to the early church. So now the Bible, which is a collection of documents that are older than the writings of the fathers. I just showed you from there, the spirit is not the father and the spirit has the attributes of God. That's not good enough, but now you want to go to the church fathers? I don't mind. I love the fathers, but that's ironic to me because when I quote the church fathers to Muslims, oh, yeah, see, that's why they corrupted the faith. Okay, I don't get it. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. So what, what evidence do you want from whom? So the Bible wasn't good enough? Well, I got that, but I get like, because it needs, in order for that to come together, it needs interpretation and you know, I guess interpretation needs to be authoritative, right? But that's what you do with any book, even the Quran. So you took one particular Muslim sect's interpretation, one sect of Islam's interpretation. But then even in Sunni Islam, you have the Ash'ari and the Maturidi. They don't agree with the Salaf Salih. And then even among Muslims, you have the Shia, and they have different branches of Shiaism. So not only do they don't agree with Sunnis in every aspect, but even among themselves. I mean, we can do this all day. So again, why did you become a Muslim? Well, like I said, it was much simpler at the at the start. It was at the start, but you see how confusing it gets later on, right? Yeah. Okay, now I just sent you an article. Did the Christians worship the Holy Spirit? Did the anti-Nicene fathers worship the Holy Spirit as God Almighty? This is a response to Muslims. Now, guys, I just sent you the link to the article. This is why you got to study these articles, learn the arguments, and this is why you got to watch the sessions because, see, I'm equipping you by the grace of the Holy Spirit because these are the objections, crystals, everyone else, you see? Okay, now, point being, you jumped into religion not knowing it, and you abandoned religion that you didn't know. So now, if you're uncertain whether the Trinity was affirmed historically, which it was, then why embrace Tawheed when even among Muslims, they can't even agree on the exact nature of Tawheed? Well, to be fair, there is more consensus right because i think sunnis are like 80 percent of muslims no there's not more consensus because among sunnis the ashari and maturidi say allah does not have hands does not have a shin these are metaphorical expressions that need to be allegorized you can't even agree on the nature of god what do you mean so among the 80 percent sunnis what percentage says allah has two right hands they are real unlike anything in creation and he has a shin and he has a foot and he has at least two eyes. And they are actual characteristics unlike anything in creation. And then on top of that, what do you do with the fact that among the Salafi, Salaf Salih, you have them condemning those Asharis and Maturidis who believe in what I call the Islamic version of communion of saints, seeking the intercession of the awliya, the friends of Allah, because they believe they're alive and they can pray for you, which the Salafis condemn as shirk. So what consensus are you talking about, buddy? Uh, I don't know. Exactly. So what is it about the Trinity that's still hindering you? Well, no, I got, like, I can see how you pull it from Scripture now. But um. So what's the problem with the acceptance of the Trinity when you're accepting a God you don't even know? When I'm telling you about him, you're like, so do you actually believe, honestly, Allah has a shin that he's going to unveil? No. 
But then that means you're denying the plain reading of the Quran and the Hadith. So are you now... Wait, was well, that in the Quran or is that Hadith? That's in the Quran, 6842, and interpreted by Muhammad to mean that that's the day when Allah will reveal his shin. Is that real? I'm not a Muslim. I think it's a joke. What do you mean it's that real? But it's in the Quran, the day when the shin will be unveiled. And then if you sit there, what the hell is the shin? Then you're a Sunni Muslim. You go to Bukhari and says, that's the shin that Allah will unveil. Here, it's me. Look at my shin. How the hell is looking at Allah's shin going to let me know that's Allah? I'll give we'll you the hadith. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. is it a hadith or is it the, is it the Quran? Quran here, buddy. A lot of snack bar. A lot of snack bar. Here it is. Chapter 68, verse 42. Halali Khan, the shin. Not by my shinny shin shin. Here you go. So I want to know. Remember the day when the shin will be laid there, laid bare. What shin is going to be laid bare? What is this about? Do you know the meaning? No. Sal Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari. Because you're a Sunni now, right? Yeah. Bukhari, the most authentic collection of narrations, say, this is Allah's shin, which he will uncover, by which Muslims, oh, that's our Lord. You want me to get you the hadith? Or are you too shocked because you're like, uh, I don't know what I signed up for. So this is this passage that I'm seeing on screens from the Quran. Yes, 6842. Other Muslims are embarrassed to translate it literally, but it is shin. And that's how Muhammad interpreted it. If you go with the hadith, if you want to reject the hadith, then we're back to square one. What is this shin that will be unveiled? Yeah, I don't know. So if I go to the Hadith, I go to Bukhari, it's Allah's shin. Do you want to see the Hadith? No, nah, I got it. So you want to follow this grotesque-looking monster as God? Because if you actually go to the Arabic, the Arabic says Allah has at least three eyes. The word for eyes, ask any Arabic speaker, and I got an ark, I'm going to give it to you. He has at least three eyes, and the Hadith say he has two right hands. That looks like a grotesque, deformed monster. Two right hands. Yeah, I saw your, I saw your. Uh, picture and you're laughing at your own God because this is what you're supposed to believe as a Salafi. You know that, right? Well, I, I don't know. So you just pick and choose. All right. Well, I don't like this. So I'm going to be a Sufi or I'm going to be Nashari, and you keep going like this is going to be cafeteria religion. Well, I'll have that, but no, thank you on this. You know, any, meeny, miny, mo. This had these days, the rest got to go. So you become your own standard again. All right, You're well, now becoming a standard, right? All right, well, I can accept everything you just said, but like, don't Christians have the same problem with that? Which problems? Sex and different, differing beliefs. Yeah, well, what does that have to do with God? We're talking about God. If you're talking about God, every be sect believes there's Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, how do they define? Father, Son, and Spirit, and how they relate to each other. Well, if you go to the scriptures, and if you go to the successors of the apostles, like you mentioned Ignatius, those who were taught by the apostles, appointed by the apostles, not their opponents, were the heretics that were exposing, they all will tell you, Father is not the Son, Son is not the Spirit, Spirit is not the Father, but the Son and Spirit are not created. That's why I just gave you an article. What did the church writers and fathers before Nicaea said about the spirit. But if you go among Christians, even those who think Jesus is a creature, they'll say, yeah, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we all see there's three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What does that mean? But here I'm talking about something fundamental to the one God you believe in. Does he have body parts or no? Now, they don't use the word body parts, but they'll say, yeah, he has two hands. We don't believe that about God. We believe God as God, God as God, exists before there was time, space, and place, he created time, space, and place, which means he's not a being that is embodied. Because if you have a body, that requires space. God is bodiless and spaceless. He is existence. So he doesn't need a body, doesn't have a body, and doesn't have body parts. Now, God can assume a form and appear in a shape and become man without ceasing to be God. But the Salafis are not saying that. They're saying, no, Allah always has existed with two right hands and at least two eyes and a shin and a foot. How? Because that makes him bodily. And if he's bodily, that means he has to have space because a body has to have a place to dwell. And if it's dwelling in a place, 
that place can't be created because that's the place that his body's contained therein. And if his body's uncreated, then the space is uncreated that uh, contains it. Well, this I thought, is fundamental to the nature of your God. I thought God in Christianity is supposed to be a man, though, isn't he? Like, like I mean, if like I show body. you in Scripture, it says God is not a man that should lie, son of man. Will you now repent and get baptized? Because you just butchered the Scripture. Well, no, I thought he's like in Genesis. It says he created us in his image. And so the same Bible that says he's not a man. So yet exactly. you now butcher Genesis one. See again, it's your thinking. Because it didn't just say he created man. It says he created male and female according to his image. So according to you, God has female parts and masculine parts. So he has female genitalia and male no. genitalia. No. So why don't but, you uh, stop misreading these passages? Because that's well, I not thought he created image. man. I thought it says he creates Adam in his image. Okay, and and what is Adam? Did you read it? Male and female is called Adam. You're not listening. Do you even know where you're quoting from? No, nah, I mean, I'm just going off what I did. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't go by hearsay. And don't assume, because when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Well, I thought... Yeah, like, you I'm keep thinking, genuine. and that's the problem. You think too much. Maybe you should stop thinking as much and listen. It says, well, let I... us take Adam in our image. Male and female, he created them, and they were both called Adam. So does God have tits? No. But no, let's go to your logic, because you keep thinking. And that's the problem. You keep thinking, brother. Take it easy. So if I go to your logic, since male and female are the Adam created in his image... So according to you, God has tits. No. Does he have a huge uh, tush? All right, we don't have to keep going. I got. I got what you're saying. Okay. Does he use Botox? Yeah. Stop misreading the Bible, buddy. You don't know the Bible. Stop misquoting it. So notice how you ran again from your God having a body to the Bible, which you misunderstood. So I'm going to ask you again: If you're a Salafi, does your God have these body parts eternally and uncreated? If you're Salafi, yes. How? Come on, man. How? Convert me. I'm waiting. Because sneakers I... converted you. If, in fact, if you want, I'll give you a brand new pair of sneakers. You don't have to follow those sneakers. <laughs> Buddy, wh what's your real hang up about the Trinity? Because you have no reason to remain a Muslim. So what's <laughs> stopping you? You should leave Islam immediately. So what's stopping you from accepting the true God in Christ? I don't know. I kind of. I'll read the articles. What is it though? You still didn't tell me. What is your problem? Well, no, with the people? Trinity. I can see the Trinity now. Um, well, what is your you problem? With following, yeah, I know. I know that. But what I'm asking you: What is your problem with following the Jesus of the Bible, as opposed to Isa of the Quran? I mean, nothing really. But I just found yeah. when I was originally getting into it, I found Islam to be more simpler and how easier is it to understand. Now? Well, no, but. Okay. So my question to you, even on the issue, who would you would rather have a role model? Jesus or Muhammad? Be honest. You know, I mean, going, right? Yeah, I, get, I know where you're going. Just take yeah. it. I'm not even going to answer. Just take it down the route. Okay. So, you know, in your heart of hearts, Muhammad is the most pathetic excuse for a human being and can't be a prophet because of his example. If you can, in your heart, follow this man, which you know did things. That if Jesus was standing before him, he would crush him under his feet. He's already in hell now because you reject the real Jesus. Then you're in the wrong religion, bud. Because I know your conscience convicting because in Romans 2, 14 and 15, we're told. God has put his law in your heart, which convicts you. Now, as you're getting convicted, the more you resist, the more dangerous it becomes. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. He convicts your heart. Wake up. Look at this filth. You really would justify this? You're getting convicted, I can tell, because when you even said, yeah, the nine-year-old thing, I knew it bothered you. But the more you resist the spirit convicting your heart and that moral ethical code that he put it put in your heart as an image bearer of God, the more hardened you become, and then you reach a point of no return. That's when it becomes dangerous for you, buddy. Right now, the spirit is still working you because I know because you reach out to me. That means there's still hope. I didn't reach out to you. That means the spirit is getting your attention. But if you now continue to resist, you are treading in dangerous territory and you may reach a point of reprobation where you so anger the spirit, no matter how much favor he shows you, and now you blaspheme the spirit and he hands you over and it's too late for you. I pray it doesn't get to that point. But I'm going to give you an article here. I want you to read about Allah's body parts. There it is right there. 
right? But you know where I'm going with this. And if you have more questions, surely we'll answer it, but I'll let you know, and I'm not going to go through it. Muhammad, 54-year-old, mounting a nine-year-old, the Quran sanctioning, sanctioning pedophilia, the Quran allowing men to take captive women married and raping them and selling them. These things should bother you. And don't forget, the second largest sect in Islam is Shia Islam. And you ask sneakers and Uthman Fibin, ask them, say, did your prophet, according to your Sunni tradition, Sunni tradition, allow at one time Zawaj al muta pleasure marriage? Yes. They'll say he abrogated it. That's fine. But did he allow it? Yes. Okay. Do the Shia still believe it's permissible? Yes. Okay, I sent you that link. I'm going to send you one more. Now, I want to ask you just one question, and that's it. And if you have questions, I'll stay. If you want to finish, it's up to you. But I'm going to give you one more article. Be honest with me before God. If you're living at the time, Muhammad, you were living at the time, Muhammad, and Muhammad or his companion said, look, we're going to marry your sister for three days. Then I'll divorce your sister and pay her money. How would you feel about that? Be honest with me. Not good. But that's what Muhammad did. Even the Sunni sources say it. Now, they say it's abrogated, but the Shias say, no, we still do it. How are you going to follow this man, dude? I don't know how you're going to follow him, but let me give you one more article. And do you remember when he read in Romans 8, it says that when God sends a spirit into your heart, in Galatians 4, you become a child of God, a son of God, because the spirit makes you one with Christ and you share in his sonship. So God becomes your father. Do you remember that? We read that? Yeah. Abba, father. Mm -hmm. Is Allah your father? Slave owner. And you're okay with being a slave and not a son? Well, that's up to you, man. Jesus says, if all you are is a slave, you have no place in the master's house. The son came to set you free to make you a child of God. So if you want to be a slave, more power to you. Glory to God, I'm a son of God. And this is why we hate Muhammad, because he abolished adoption. Because he lusted for his adopted son's wife. You got issues, man. So just to sum up, and if you have questions on the Trinity, I just gave you another article. Your prophet abolished adoption. So in Muslim lands, you can't adopt children. You can probably take care of them for a while, but once they reach maturity, out they go. So barren couples who can't have children, can't adopt, and orphans can't be adopted and call a couple mother and father because of your prophet, because he lusted for his adopted son's wife. He divorced her and then he married her and then he abolished adoption to save face. Your prophet allowed women to be prostituted, calling it pleasure marriage. And the Shia say we can still do it to this day. Your prophet allowed and continues because if you do jihad to take captive women, even if they're married, like your mother, my mother, have sex with them and sell them. And your prophet mounted a nine-year-old who was playing with dolls and allows in the Quran for marriages with minors. You sure you want to continue to follow this guy? Man, I hope you wake up sooner than later. Now, you got all those articles, right? Yeah. All right. You have any more questions, Trinity, or you want to end it here? Nah, that's good. I'll, uh, I'll look into the articles. You know where to find me. Save the articles. Click on them before you leave. I, I already pinned all of them. Okay, buddy. Come on, find me. I'll be here waiting for you. And keep watching, keep reading, keep praying. And don't tell God what he can and cannot be because God hates that. Say, God, I'll accept you as you are. Jesus, I'll accept you as you are. Holy Spirit, I'll accept you as you are. I will no longer put limits on you because God doesn't want you to tell him what he can and cannot be and what he can and cannot do. Don't tell him because you're going to get him upset. He wants you to love him as he is. Love me as I am and he'll bless you. All right? All right. All right, buddy. Come back when you want to talk. All right. Have a good night. Okay. Come back. All right. So, guys, we're done. Pray for him, the young man. Victor, pray for him.